Hi, everybody. Welcome to class. So welcome to uh, History of Asian American, Asian Americans. This is a, a split class, both a history class and ethnic studies class. And so um, uh, we're going to jump in the syllabus. And uh, I just want to assure you guys it is a wonderful topic. I love teaching this class and we're going to have a good time together. <laughs> and uh, I know the syllabus is not the most exciting lecture of the whole semester. Um, but it's really important, and uh, it is our first introduction to this wonderful topic of the Asian American, Asian American experience here in America. Um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, as we're going through this, you might want to grab a pen or pencil or highlighter occasionally. Um, actually, highlighter, you're looking at a screen. I guess you don't need those things, although you can definitely print out the syllabus if that's helpful to you guys, and it may be. So there'll be, there'll be a link here on this page and also in modules where you can print the syllabus out. So if that's helpful to you, you guys know your own learn, learning uh, styles and what works best for you guys, but you might want to have print the syllabus out so that way you can read along if you want to um, and highlight things that are important to you. So uh, welcome and let's jump uh, right in. So uh, again, this is a, a history slash ethnic studies. So history 52, 8, 19 or ethnic studies section. 52828 or 52833. Although that might vary depending on the semester. <laughs> All right, so uh, here we go. Please read and review the syllabus carefully. And the reason why I put that in there is it's really important for you guys to be successful and know what's required of you in the class, what's required of me as well. It's a mutual contract. And so the syllabus is really critical and important to know. Uh, if I need to change things during the semester, I'll always, of course, notify you guys and let you guys know what is going on. If it's important for the success of the class and I need to change something, modify something. But, of course, I would let you guys know uh, what that is. All right, so class information. So just the bare bones here. So I'm Michael Lorenz, professor of history here at Merced College. By the way, just as a full disclosure, I'm not an ethnic studies professor. Now, this class is a split class, and so I will do my best to introduce you guys to, to the lens of ethnic studies. Um, and in our first lecture, after this one, of course, uh, I'll go into what exactly that looks like. So I won't do that here in the syllabus lecture, but I just want you guys to know I'm a historian. So my perspective, my education, my training, my perceptions are as a historian. But there's a very nice overlap between history and ethnic studies. Now, again, we have some differences. But anyways, we don't need to get into all that right now. Just I want to let you know where I'm coming from. All right. My office is in the IC building, the social science, sorry, building A, social science building, and my office is in room 219. Now, I realize this is an online class. Some of you guys probably won't set foot on campus the entire semester. <laughs> and that's fine. But some of you guys will have classes here. So if you are on campus, um, uh, swing by, say hi. Uh, you can see my office hours, which I'll get to here in just a moment. So swing by. Uh, we can talk a little bit. I always like seeing my online students in 3D. So <laughs> if you're on campus, uh, please swing by and say hi. Um, if I'm around and you can, you can see my office hours when's a good time. But anyways, that's where you can find me uh, in person. That's my office phone number. And of course, the best way to get a hold of me most of the time would be through my email, as you see listed right there. I just mentioned office hours, and so my in-person office hours and the class information. Uh, wait, we'll get the office hours in just a minute. So our class info is August uh, 14 to September 22. Now that is a very short time. In fact, I'm going to make a separate video just on that topic. I'm not going to jump into that one right now. I'm going to turn my cell phone off. Uh, but but it will go by quick. But again, I'll leave that for a brief separate video talking about this, the, the pace of class and speed of the class, but we'll put that aside for right now. All right, <clears throat> so days, again, it's an online class, so there's some flexibility in that. It's one of the reasons why you guys are probably in the online class, because there is some nice uh, maneuverability uh, of when you do things. Now, obviously, there's a lot of set dates when assignments are due. So that is not so flexible, but as far as like when you do the readings, uh, when you watch the videos, now, again, there's a, a weekly schedule, and you want to follow that but when you do that within the week, obviously, that's a lot of flexibility. Perfect for you guys. That's nice to you know taking an online class. Same thing for times. Again, similar. 
All right, so in-person office hours, I'll be here in my office, which you guys see right now, this wonderful space right here, which is kind of clutter with my books and, <laughs> and stuff. In any case, uh, my office hours are Monday, Monday, Wednesday from 11 to 11.50 a.m. right here in my office. Those are the in-person. But I go, again, you guys, of course, are many of you maybe not even on campus. That's totally fine. My office hours for online Zoom office hours are from 11 to 2 p.m. on Tuesday. Now, by the way, I may be available other times. So if you cannot make uh, either one of those in person, and I understand if you could not make that, or if the, the Tuesday Zoom office hours don't work for you, that could also be fine. Just let me know. Just let me know, hey, you know, I can't make his office hours. And maybe we can put our heads together and find a time that works for both of us. And we can do a Zoom um, office hour at a different time. If you have some questions or I can help you, um, just let me know. So email me and maybe put our heads together and find a way to make that work. All right, let's get to uh, the bread and butter here and uh, require books for the class. So we're going to re read three books this semester. We're going to use the Making the Asian American History by Erica Lee. This is the preeminent or the best, uh, probably general history of the Asian American experience in America right now. Highly recommend this book. Now, because of time, we're going to read only portions. This is a pretty good sized book, as you guys see right there. <laughs> we're just going to read portions of this. We're not reading this whole book. We'll read portions. Now, the two books we're going to read. The first one is Viet Thanh Nguyen's The Sympathizer, a memoir. Actually, a novel. Uh, this book is fantastic. It's a very challenging read. I think you guys will really enjoy it. There we go. <laughs> it's a very challenging read. Um, it's been fascinating and gives us a really good, what I would say, introduction probably to how an ethnic studies uh, professor would look at some of the, these topics that we'll get into with the Asian American experience. Yeah, I won't go into details now with that, but uh, I think you guys will really enjoy that book. I'll give you just a very brief uh, teaser or, or trailer for this book. The main character you see depicted there on the cover, he is uh, Vietnamese, but actually he's mixed race. His father was a French Catholic priest, and his mother is Vietnamese. So he's mixed race. So right there introduces a high complexity. Uh, when, the no when the novel starts, because it is a novel, it's fiction, um, our main character, uh, is working for the South Vietnamese military at the end of the Vietnam War. But here's where it really starts getting more complex. Even though he's, wor he's working as a South Vietnamese soldier in intelligence, uh, but his real role is he's secretly a communist spy for North Vietnam and the communist system. So he appears to be a little South Vietnamese soldier fighting against the communist invasion of South Vietnam. But in reality, his true role is he's actually a communist spy. And then to add one more element of complexity is when the South Vietnamese government forces flee South Vietnam in 1975 and end the Vietnam War, um, he goes with them into exile in the United States and California. But he's sent there by his communist handlers. The handlers means the people who control him and that's a spy. They send him there to keep an eye on the South Vietnamese exile community inside the United States. So I sent him there, again, to his, continue his cover. His cover is he's a loyal South Vietnamese soldier, and he's the war's been lost, and then the escaped refugees to the United States, and that's why he's there in the Vietnamese population in Southern California. Um, but, of course, his role is very special because he remains a spy for the communist authorities to monitor the activities of the South Vietnamese exile population in Southern California. That gets immensely more complex, how he's treated there as a Vietnamese person in America, how his own community treats him, his own perception. There's a lot there. It's a fantastic read. It's a spy novel. <laughs> it's also an identity crisis. Who is he? Where is his true loyalties? How does all this play out? There's murder and intrigue and romance and torture. <laughs> It's a, it's, it's a fantastic read. It's, again, it's not an easy read. It'll be a challenge read for you guys. But there's a reason why this book uh, is rated as well as it is. It's a fantastic book. Um, you guys will really enjoy it as you grapple with it. Once you finish that, we're going to read a, something completely different. This is by uh, Michelle Zahner called Crying in H Mart. 
Now, this is not fiction. This is a memoir of her life uh, and actually her and her mother. Now, a little bit similar to the novel you guys read, um, Michelle Zauner, only she's a real person. Uh, she is Korean American. Actually, she's Caucasian Korean. Her dad is white. Her mom is Korean. She's living in the Northwest. She's a musician going to college. And the book is about her identity as a, a half Korean, half Caucasian. How does she grapple with that with her Korean mom who's from Korea and her Caucasian dad? How does she figure all that out? It's a relationship book about her and her mom. And then as the story emerges, uh, the crying H Mart, like what is H Mart? H Mart is a big supermarket full of all kinds of Asian food, but especially Korean food. And I'll talk about that later on. I don't get too deep into this, but but it's about what happens to her, her relationship with her and her mom, especially. And her mom tragically gets cancer. It's how all that plays out and how she copes with that, the loss of her mom, her sense of identity. What does it mean to be an Asian person, but also kind of split? And that is part and parcel we'll talk about in this class. It's a wonderful read, a powerful read. It, it is kind of a tearjerker, frankly, but you guys will really enjoy this. And you guys will also have to get to an H mark. There's some in San Jose. I'll talk about that maybe in some later videos, but you can see what she's talking about. Uh, but both of those are really good reads. I can't recommend those books highly enough. And we're going to spend quite a bit of time this semester as you guys are jumping in reading those two wonderful books. All right. There are the authors right there. That's Erica Lee. She's the author there on the, on the left of this wonderful, and probably the best general history of the Asian American experience. And there's Viet Nguyen, the author, the sympathizer, brilliant writer, brilliant thinker. Uh, you guys get to know him. And that is Michelle Zana down the right. She's a current musician. Um, she's touring. Maybe some of you guys are into more of the alternative scene. Maybe you guys already know her. Um, but a talented musician and obviously a very good writer. <laughs> So those are the three people who'll be hanging out with this semester. So I, you guys already know this. So I'll move through this right quickly. Of course, we're using Canvas, which you guys are on right now. And we'll be using Zoom, Zoom for uh, office hours or a chance for us, you and I to talk a little bit if you're not going to be here on campus. <laughs> yeah, course description. I put that mural in from Koreatown in L.A. showing the leader of North Korea, as I guess we want him to be, holding a donut and a... Maybe is that a mocha or I don't know what sure he's drinking there. I see K-Town there in the background. Of course, uh, he's not all cuddly. He's a North Korean. He's a brutal dictator. Uh, come into America. Yeah. But I wish you'd come to America and have a complete reboot of who he is for the poor North Korean people. That would be wonderful. Get some good Korean barbecue down in L.A. Maybe you'd open up his mind. <laughs> this American system, which he rails and attacks frequently, makes the the focus of all the evil in the world, be the North Korean dictator that he is. Wouldn't it be wonderful if he could get to L.A. and have a good time there, go to a Dodger game, <laughs> hang out on the beach for a while, and transform. That'd be good for so many. All right. So, uh, goals of the course. Well, we're going to try, again, this is interdisciplinary. We're talking about both as a historian, but ethnic space perspective as well, and looking at the broader Asian American experience, by the way, which is a huge topic. There's no way in one semester we can cover this massive topic. We're going to just do our best. The way I describe it to you guys is we think we're kind of an intellectual buffet. And you walk in this buffet, and the buffet is full of all kinds of Asian American food. You name it there. There's Filipino food. There's Chinese food. By the way, Chinese food itself is a huge category, right? But there's all kinds of Japanese food. There's Korean food. There's Thai there's Lao, there's Hmong, there's Indian, there's Pakistani, there's Afghani, on and on and on. Taiwanese, um, and I just scratched the surface, right? Uh, Indonesian food, uh, Malaysian food, so uh, Cambodian food. So as you guys know, Asia is massive, Mongolian food. Um, so that's what we're going to try to do within the context of the American experience is you're walking through this buffet, enjoy. There's so many fascinating and delicious foods of all kinds. That's what we're doing intellectually this semester. And I'll do my best to uh, put that buffet out for you guys. And again, nice enough, hey, you guys can also go down your own personal interests. If you find something in this class interesting to you, 
fantastic. Dig into it deeper beyond the survey course that we're going through right now. All right, that's Japan down in San Francisco there on the left and uh, Chinese New Year Parade in New York City. Um, I would recommend, by the way, and I'll probably do an extra credit video, but there's all kinds of amazing places you guys can go for extra credit for this class. Uh, Japantown, San Francisco is one of them. There's also a wonderful Japantown in uh, LA. But there's many other places too. I mentioned the H Mart already. Yes, and many other amazing places you guys can go. The Asian American Art Museum in San Francisco is outstanding. There's many things you guys can do for extra credit that are beyond sitting in, sitting in a comfortable chair at home reading a book. Although, I'm not in any say negative. Re reading is a fantastic window into the human experience. But it's also nice to taste it, <laughs> to feel it, to have your toes in those locations um, that give you a better insight into the Asian American experience. All right. So a wonderful quote by James Baldwin, where Baldwin writes, history does not refer merely, even principally, to the past. On the contrary, great force history comes to the fact that we carry it within us. Our unconsciously controlled by it in many ways, and history is literally present in all that we do. As a historian, I, that's probably my favorite single quote by any author or thinker of why it's so important for you and I to be aware of history. Because that point, part we say it's not in the past, and we're often unconsciously controlled by it. It's a wonderful reason of why we study to know and to understand, so we're not limited to our small microcosm of my life experiences. There's a huge, broader world of reality around us, and for us not to stay locked in my little tiny world of just me and what I've lived with within my family, my friends, my community. By the way, that's all good. I'm not saying that negatively. That's good. But reality is so much beyond just only that small area. Reading's one of the ways that we take us beyond that, other experiences. So James Baldwin is simply remind us of a truism, which is to be curious about the human condition. To be curious and to look and to think and discover. Allow your world to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and better, frankly. Because there's so much wisdom, there's so much delicious food, cultural items, art, you name it. Um, philosophy, perceptions of life, perspectives, um, different conceptions of reality out there, uh, again, get into that rich, amazing buffet, and that's what James Baldwin is encouraging us to do. All right. I think for time, I don't make this video too long, but uh, in a history class, I think it's two, we're trying to dig more deeply, more critically into the human experience. Maybe I think I'm not going to take time to dissect all that right there in front of you. You guys are welcome to read it. Um, in fact, I think we're going to fast forward through most of that. Although I will say um, we'll be using primarily secondary sources in this class, although there are exceptions to that. Um, but we're going to look at to the best of our ability, the Asian American experience and all its variety as we, as we, to the best we can. <clears throat> There's a student learning outcomes. Again, I think for the sake of time, I'm not going to read through all those. You're welcome to do that. We are certainly trying to do all those goals. Um, but I think the best way to do that is to just immerse ourselves in the experience. But that is certainly those, as you see those, that's A through F. Those are the goals we have to broaden our understanding of the experience. And that's the the, the benchmarks we play out for ourselves to make sure we're doing that. Okay, well, let's get down to what you're probably waiting for is what do I have to do for class? <laughs> what, do, what do I have to do? So here we go. So what, do, what is what is required of you, the student? We're talking so about introduction, kind of philosophy, uh, theory. Let's get out of really practical. So bread and butter, what do you guys have to do? So first one is there will be a, quite a bit of reading in this class and justly so. Reading is critical for us to understand the experience of the other, the other person, to understand their mind and their, their conceptions, to take us out of, again, our limited perceptions that we have, take us into another person's mind at depth. So as you guys know, we have our books, and we'll do a lot of reading in these books. You guys will read, as you guys know, The Sympathizer and Crying in the H Mart. So along with the reading assignments, which you guys see in modules, of course, um, 
as you're reading, you'll do an assignment that's directly connected to the reading. And I'll make a separate video of how to do this in more detail. I'm just going to very briefly give you guys highlights what you're doing. But essentially, what you're doing is you may be reading, say, a chapter here. Well, no more than one chapter, but yeah, when you're reading a chapter here in uh, the Nguyen's uh, Sympathizer or in uh, Shell's Downer's Quiet Ishmar, as you read that chapter, um, you're looking for two quotes from that chapter that you, that quote, grabbed you. And the first quote that grabs you, you'll, you'll type that quote into a running Word document and you'll describe why you believe that quote is significant to you or to the story. I don't care which way you go with that. Again, you can choose any quote from that chapter you want to, but can you describe why it's significant? Does it, what does it reveal about the main character or the era or perceptions? Or why is it significant to you? You can go either way with that. Uh, and the second quote you'll pick is a quote that you came across and generated a natural question you have. Like you read that quote and you like, and you, you'll write that quote down, and then you'll put down a question directly related to that quote you just put down. Like, I don't understand like what's taking place here. I don't understand what they're referring to here, etc. And I'll maybe leave it there. I won't go into more detail because again, well, I'll make a video that has an example exactly how to do this. It's not hard. I think it'll be relatively easy for you guys. It just requires you to be thoughtful and selective as you're reading. But you will steadily do that, what's called the direct quote analysis for each individual chapter. And you'll take those things upon your document. And eventually at the midterm, at the end of the semester, you'll turn in all those quotes that you've been collecting for each chapter uh, in, in the assignment and modules. And yeah, I know it's kind of maybe like, I don't exactly know what that is. You're good. Remember, I'll make a separate video to go into more detail and a, a direct sample so you guys can visually look exactly what I'm talking about so you can see it. But I want to make the syllabus video not too long, so I'm going to stop right there and say, see the uh, reading response direct analysis video explanation, which will be there in modules for you guys too, and you'll get the details. All right. There'll be Canvas discussions, and uh, those are pretty self explanatory, I think. Just keep you guys have a chance to get interact with each other. Those are important. You'll be able to still see them in modules. Um, I will have some documentaries or movies or videos for you guys to watch. You guys will really enjoy this. I try to give you guys a wide range of them. Uh, movies, uh, comedy, some serious commentary, some analysis, and uh, even the authors themselves, both uh, Viet Nguyen, so you have to hear them in person. And the same thing with uh, Michelle Zahner, so you can actually hear from the author beyond their book, but you can actually see them and hear them describing what they're doing. Um, I think you guys will really enjoy that. And then finally, we have two last remaining things. Uh, there will be a paper that will be due at the end of the semester. It'll be due on all three books. There we go. There we go. <laughs> and last but not least, yeah, Erica Lee's Asian American. Um, that paper will be built, built on all three of those. Um, and then finally, there are exams, and exams are based on the lectures you guys watch in modules. So in modules for each week, you'll see each week is its own separate unit. You'll see a reading assignment there, or you, and then you'll see um, lectures you'll watch and take notes on, and you'll see any other assignments that we could be a video response or a discussion. But each week is packaged as its sole unit. So you guys see what you need to do each week as you click in modules. It's all dated for you guys, all ready to go. The exams are 100% based on the lectures. So when you guys are watching the lectures, make sure you guys take good notes. Now the good news for you guys is the, lecture, the exams are open book. Open book? Well, actually not big, I'm sorry. <laughs> the good news is the exams are open note. So when you take good notes during the lectures, when you take the exam, you can have all your notes stacked up ready to go. So as you're going through the exam, some of the questions, because you studied uh, your notes, get right for the exam naturally. But additionally, if you come across a question like, oh man, I remember reading about that. I remember that being in the lecture. Actually, I'm not reading about it. I remember that being in the lecture. I don't remember now. But again, you'll have your notes with you. You can quickly turn to that place in your notes and you can perhaps find the answer as you're taking the exam. So it's open note exam. Now, it's not open to the sources, but it's open note. So take good notes. Uh, while you guys are watching the lectures, um, and that we take the exam, the exams are based, as I mentioned, solely on the lectures, 
you guys will do very well. One more tip about the lectures. Um, my lectures typically are about an hour. Now, I know some students are like, oh, an hour. Ooh, I don't, well, that's the standard in college. But, but the nice thing with a recorded class, because we're an online class, you guys know, is if you're learning comfort level, it's like, look, after like 15, 20 minutes, I begin to zone a little bit. Perfect. That's, that, that's fine, right? So just watch the first third of the lecture, take good notes, and then walk away. You can go do some Pilates, yoga, walk the dog, <laughs> go on YouTube, game time, get something to eat, <laughs> get some coffee, you know, whatever, uh, and then come back to it, right? That's a wonderful thing about, so you guys know yourself, so just be a good consumer of how you learn best. Now, if you can do the full hour in one sitting and you take good notes, all right, the nice thing is you can, you can pause, right? So as I'm lecturing, if I point out this is really important, perfect, pause the lecture, right? And you, you simply write down uh, what you'll see in front of you because as I'm lecturing, I'll lecture with my notes in front of you. So you can just pause and just copy what you see there. But just make it work the best for you guys. I want you guys to be successful. I want you guys to all do very well in class, be a wonderful experience. And for the lectures to work very well for you guys and be prepared for the exams. So just know yourself. Um, What's your best learning strategy as you're watching the lectures and taking good notes? All right, so how does all this break down? You can see the response to reading. Remember, that's as you read each chapter, you'll be finding those quotes and they'll either do a significance or a question. Um, that's worth this, a big part of your grade. It's worth 22% of your grade. Um, by the way, you guys, again, you guys will do very well on that, I think. So uh, that'd be very helpful to your grade, a strong part of your grade that you guys will do well on that. Canvas discussions, you can see what those are worth in the class too. Uh, the videos, movies, and so forth, also worth a big chunk of, class, of points because uh, again, it'll be important for a class. The final paper, you can see that there too, 150 points. And finally, there'll be two exams, two exams, again, based entirely on lecture notes, and they're worth quite a bit too, as you can see there. That's how the whole class breaks down. Nice thing is as I grade, of course, you guys can follow along as your points begin to accumulate. You can see how you're doing in the class. All right. Uh, there we go, the faces of the very diverse Asian American community. And by the way, it's much more diverse than even that. But the, when we say Asian America, remember that's really, you're talking about, and it depends what Asian community you're talking about, but sometimes they include portions of the Middle East all the way through East Asia and even into uh, the Pacific because uh, the Asian American experience also includes often Pacific Island experience as well, too. General class info, late work. So um, try very hard not to have late work. Uh, this semester will go by quick. Um, but of course, if you have a medical emergency, something really important come up, let me know why that is. Um, try to let me know ahead of time if possible, if you know that something's taking place, but just communicate with me and let me know what's going on. And I, as a case by case basis, I make decisions whether I allow students to turn in late work or not, depending on again. Uh, the reason behind it. Absent students, not, it's not really for our class, it's more of an in-person class. I would just simply say um, an online class, the temptation is to uh, procrastinate and not really follow the work and so forth. Um, but that works itself out because that student is going to probably fail the class. So the, my only comment with that is um, keep up with the work in a typical week. You'll see the work very clearly laid out for you guys. Make sure you keep up with that. I want you guys to be successful. If you fall behind, for example, on the reading the questions, that snowballs and it gets worse and worse. Uh, don't let that happen. Just, you know, be proactive and make it happen. If you need to drop the class, protect your GPA. As a professor, I lean toward non-dropping because I don't want to drop students who, for having legitimate reasons why they can't be there. So, uh, but if you need to drop, you know, life happens. It happens to all of us. When I was in college, I had to drop some classes occasionally. Uh, if that happens, just protect your GPA. Uh, get out of the class. Don't end up being left on my roll sheet in a semester and you get an F because you weren't even there. I feel bad for those students, but we have to give you guys a grade by state law. We have to. So just protect your GPA if you have to get out. Academic dishonesty, cheating, and plagiarism. Oh, this is an important topic, <laughs> uh, especially for an online class. <laughs> but for any class, it's important. So uh, 
consequences of uh, any form of cheating, academic dishonesty, plagiarism are quite serious. And right here at the back, I want to talk about uh, AI writing tools, for example, chat, GPT, or similar. So if you use those writing tools, um, you could get a zero for the assignment because it's not you, right? I want to know what your perceptions are as you formulate and, and think about the uh, what you digested with the readings or the videos. I want to know what you do. I don't want to know what AI thinks. <laughs> AI is amazing. I'm not against AI. I want to know what you think. So a repackage formula, I don't know what that means. Now, by the way, maybe you you read the assignment or you watched the video, but you're feeling uncomfortable with your writing, and so you decide to go with the chat GBT or some version of AI writing. But see, I, I, I can't see that, right? So I don't know. When all I see is that's not you. So I don't know if there's any basis even for learning behind it. Now, perhaps there was. Again, perhaps you watched the, the movie and uh, you were uncomfortable with your writing, so you thought, I'm going to have AI do it for me. But see, I don't have any evidence that you watched it. I know AI <laughs> concocted a response to it, but I don't have ev evidence that you digested. And of course, we're not interested in educating AI. I'm interested in helping you guys. So if I discover uh, AI writing tools being used, uh, you'll get a zero for the assignment. It's catastrophic. So I would say it's 100% better to go with your writing, which you may feel is not quite what you want it to be, perhaps, but you get points, guaranteed points. AI stuff is a zero, catastrophic. Don't allow that to happen to you or, or cut from the sources that you AI, right? Or I know because just <laughs> students go online, they find papers and stuff. You guys know the Internet is a wonderful tool. It can be a treasure map of all kinds of things you guys can find. But the, but if it's not you in any source, if anyway, it's AI or another student, whatever, the end result is extremely negative for you. Uh, above all, you don't learn. But practically, even if that learning stuff is not so important to you, let's get really balanced. You don't want to fail the class because you've been using, you know, whatever, not in your work. AI or other students, some of the sources that are not cited, um, and then you got to take the class again. Nobody went to that, so protect yourself. So your thought is what matters. Your thought is what I grade, and so just make it sure it's your thought. Even if in your thought sometimes you feel like it's not quite what you want it to be, that's worth guaranteed points, right? Even the worst case scenario. Let's suppose you turn in a response to a. A required video and you're kind of in a hurry and it's not as good as you want it to be and let's let's go worst case let's say you get a d for that assignment to d well that's not good right it's not good but you know what that's still 55 points or 60 points whatever it is right out of 100. if you use chat gpt or some ai or some other paper you found online or you cut and paste it from source online and i discover that you get a zero it's just and then, by the way, that, that, that is a huge anchor to your overall grade, not just that assignment to your overall grade. It's a huge anchor. It might be a death knell for you to do well in the class. Don't do that. So that little demon comes on your shoulder saying, cut and paste or copy or, or get AI to do it for you. Um, don't do that. It ends very badly for you. All right, that's enough of that. Extra credit. There's all kinds of good extra credit, but I think I'm not going to go into it in this video. I want to keep this relatively short. I think I'll make a separate video just on extra credit. So um, I would encourage you guys to do that. A lot of fun, wonderful things to do for extra credit. It's good for your grade, but I also hope it's a very good experience for you. Not just, you know, not just the points, although points are great. I get it. But just the experience of these things. There's some really amazing things you can do by even beyond what you see right here. So look for my separate extra credit uh, brief description, what you guys can do. All right, finally getting to the end here, campus security. Again, you guys are typically not on campus, you're on class, but if you are, I'd recommend the Campus Shield app. It's free. Um, you don't have to have it, but it's a wonderful app if you are on campus uh, to quickly summon the college police for any reason. If you feel threatened or you see something that concerns you, Campus Shield is a wonderful app and immediately calls the campus police. Now, it does not work off campus. That's only for on campus. Again, so 
for some of you guys watching this, you don't need that. But if you are on campus for other classes, I recommend that after you guys have it on my phone here too. And I've had to use it a couple times, so I recommend having that. It's a great way to uh, get immediate assistance, whether it's a medical emergency or a safety issue, so forth, uh, or God forbid something worse. Uh, it's nice to I'm not trying to figure out how to call the. Now, obviously, you could call 911, call the police, of course, yes. But the right first responder are the campus police, and the campus shield is a great way to uh, quickly get them there. All right, some of these things do not apply to an online class, cell phone policy, you guys are online. Um, yeah, the, I will say civil academic dialogue that respects pluralism. Uh, in this discussion, that's what this really come up with via discussions. Just keep in mind that people have different perspectives. Thank God, right? We live in a very diverse environment. It's one of our great strengths in America. People may have differing opinions, naturally, that we expect that, right? If everybody had the same opinion, that would be terrifying, <laughs> right? That's an Orwellian police state. So people naturally have different opinions, just be respectful. You don't have to agree with them naturally, but it's respectful. They have a right to their opinion, their perspective. You have a right to your perspective. You don't have to agree to their perspective, but we respect the person even if we disagree with their, uh, their viewpoint, right? There's all kinds of wonderful resources here on campus, which I highly recommend to all of you guys. Uh, please make use of them. Um, for example, uh, test taking issues, all kinds of things we can do to help out. Please make use of those for those that help. Sexual misconduct for an online class, that's less likely to happen, but it could, right? So if you see anything that concerns you, please let me know uh, as soon as you can. I want to keep us in safe learning environment for all of us. So please be very cognizant of your fellow students, uh, their safety, your safety. Uh, let's make this a wonderful and safe learning environment. But you have more resources here on campus, all kinds of things to help you guys out, tutoring center, and all kinds of ways you guys get help here on campus. Please make use of all those sources. And with that, I think uh, we're done. So welcome to class, everybody. There's much more we'll get into, but that's enough for this lecture. I'm really glad to have you guys here in class. This could be a very good semester. Uh, let's jump in. I'll see you with the next video. So take care, everybody.